So uh, the last speaker of the, uh, this morning's uh, session is going to discuss the role of gender. And uh, we're pleased to have Alexander Chernotsky. I said that pretty close, right? Yeah. From the University of Chicago. And uh, please re be reminded at the end of this talk, we'll have a panel discussion. So those of you who have future questions or questions in mind, please bring them forth at that time. So uh, welcome, Alexander. Thank you. I'm going to try the... Which one? This one? You have, you have, the, you have the one. Oh, okay. Um, going back. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to, for the, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, uh, I'd like to start with thanking people who did the work um, uh, in my lab and collaborators, including Betty Terlo, she is um, uh, here, will be giving a talk. She, uh, we started our germ-free facility together, and now she's uh, the head of this quindom of hers. Um, so, um, a question of sex. How can we or should use the animal models to study sexual dimorphism of disease? And what can we learn from this model? That's the questions I'd like to address. Uh, when sex is important, um, in infectious diseases, the sensitivity to disease, uh, adverse effects of vaccination, uh, these are the si two sides of the same coin. Uh, and also vaccination efficiency is very different between genders. But all these three traits are, again, the flip side of uh, looking at autoimmunity and cancer. Um, there is huge bias uh, in different diseases, including infectious diseases, um, autoimmune diseases between males and females. Um, uh, well, one of the striking examples that uh, was uh, attempt to use the glycoprotein D adjuvant vaccine to prevent genital herpes, and it is uh, amazing that in these trials, uh, the efficiency in, serop in uh, seropositive females was 73 to 74 percent, but males had absolutely no efficiency. So the vaccine didn't go, but um, uh, it's a good lesson to learn. Um, also, uh, this is again the sex differences in response to vaccines in humans, and uh, there are some adverse effects that happen. Uh, and it's interesting that um, uh, there is a, a sex difference in response in, in females uh, and some differences can be seen at the age of two. So that's before the sex hormones are there. So that suggests that uh, there are many factors that are involved uh, in regulation of sex differences. And that, that's a figure from uh, Pippa Merrick's review uh, on that. Um, and uh, so they point out that, um, uh, point out the oh, expression of actually jinx, jinx X-linked genes as one of the possibility, uh, high expression of female hormones. Uh, but um, we should also mention the genes encoded by sex chromosomes, uh, mitochondrial genes because they're uniparental um, inheritance uh, and can, be, can act differently in different environments. And uh, the lack of androgens as opposed to presence of estrogens can be, has to be taken in consideration. Uh, what's important for today is that uh, sex-specific microbiota uh, has to be taken in uh, consideration. And that has been shown in a few studies, and I'll get to it. Um, uh, so this is my uh, view of commensal-centric view of the universe, where commensals are in the middle, and uh, the overall health depends on commensals and host genetics. But uh, what's important here that commensals are under constant press from different uh, stresses uh, like physical and chemical insults, diet, immune system, metabolism, but also biological insults. And one of the strongest biological insults is, of course, sex. Uh, so there, that's my whining list. It's confounding factors in studying microbiota host interactions. But we've been through that uh, over these two days. Um, and starting from enormous complexity of microbiota, uh, involvement of uh, communities rather than individual uh, isolated lines, uh, sensitivity to various environmental factors, multiplicity of host microbial centers, 
<laughs> sensors, the difficulties in applying Cox postulates, uh, and difficulties in cultivation. So all of that uh, leads us to um, relying a lot on um, sequencing and analysis of microbiota, which is similar to uh, trying to make sense of all these details and put them together uh, into uh, one moving vehicle. So uh, the studies tend to do the following. So they identify a particular uh, bacterium and, and uh, suggest that that's uh, the most important one. Um, but uh, now, nowadays, I think our honeymoon with sequencing is sort of 16F sequencing is sort of over. And, uh, but luckily, we have uh, this germ free uh, capabilities. That's the original Rainier's uh, isolator nowadays. And uh, they also use this, uh, in which they were dipping humans in disinfectants rather than, um, than mice, and then uh, humans were entering this. Uh, sterile facility. Now, uh, nowadays it's slightly different, uh, but what we learned using germ-free uh, capability is that microbes can be both inducers and negative regulators of autoimmunity. And my work is about autoimmunity, that's why I'm talking about it here. So direct evidence for influence of microbiota on autoimmunity came from the studies of germ-free animals. And here is the um, basically the summary of many studies done in many labs. Uh, and so they can be divided into four different categories. There are monogenic diseases that are totally insensitive to commensal regulation. Uh, there are some diseases that develop independently of commensals, uh, like type 1 diabetes, and that's what I'm focusing on. Uh, and some, di some diseases develop to different degree on commensals. Some Commensals can amplify the disease, and in some diseases, they require commensals. Uh, in reality, it's a little more uh, difficult uh, because in the same animal, in NOD mouse, you have uh, diabetes developing. Both in SPF conditions and in germ-free conditions is the same. But they also develop cellulitis, but only in uh, SPF conditions, but not in germ-free conditions. So even within this one host organism, commensal affect different autoimmune manifestations differently. Uh, long ago, uh, uh, a comparison was made by this group uh, between different facilities around the world, uh, comparing the incidence of type 1 diabetes in NOD mice. And uh, from this simple graph, you can uh, make two conclusions. One is that the, there is significant variability between the uh, facilities. And a second is that there is also variability between males and females, again, between facilities, suggesting there is environmental factor that affects uh, sexual dimorphism. Um, and that's absolutely true. So in this table, just focus on this ratio between females and males. Um, it's always, in most cases, it's more uh, present in, more penetrant in females than in males. Uh, but even in Jack's lab in type 1 diabetes repository, over the years they have a variability in that, including year 2008, where there was no, no difference between males and females. But they make a note in parentheses that in 2008 they had a trouble with light switch in the colony. So the mice were on the wrong light cycle, and light cycle can affect hormones. So. Um, that is uh, the background of that um, uh, investigation. Um, so, uh, but it tells us, sorry, I, made, I missed an important point. Here is that uh, in germ-free conditions, there is no difference between males and females. So males have as high incidence in diabetes as females. So that's the main point. So that brings us to, uh, to possibilities to explain what's happening there. And we came up with two linear models and one nonlinear model. So in, uh, lin in linear models, it's possible that hormones uh, regulate antimicrobial control and that then microbes uh, affect autoimmunity. Or microbes change uh, hormones and that can affect autoimmunity. Or uh, in dual signaling model, both signals are required. Um, so the the first model, the first linear model, would predict that males and females should have different microbiota composition. 
And that's a testable um, idea. So how do we address the issue of male-female microbiota differences? And uh, I think that can be applied to other uh, questions uh, when it concerns what concerns microbiota. Um, so uh, every experiment has some trade-off. Um, so single housed animals to be analyzed. And the reason is that coprophagy removes individual differences and can bias the results. Second, the progeny of the same parents to be analyzed. The reason, the reduction of cage effects, the influence uh, of the input microbiota, and that's the major, major problem. Third, colonization of germ free mice, and the reason we can standardize the input of microbiota. And finally, the repetition of individual experiments, and the reason for that is removal of the misleading results and avoidance of the result over interpretation. Uh, the trade offs, however, are the following. So uh, the uh, single housing is a lot more expensive and uh, have a possible influence of loneliness-induced stress. Uh, uh, this small litter size may affect the statistics of microbial analysis. Uh, colonization of germ-free mice is expensive and not yet widely available. And finally, the only problem is historically high price tag. Uh, however, since the sequencing prices are low, uh, this is a poor excuse not to repeat your experiments. Um, so we did a few of these experiments and uh, found that if you compare, um, this is um, uh, PCA analysis of um, microbiota from males and females, and uh, at four weeks of age in this ex particular experiment, uh, we did not see any di much difference between males and females, but uh, after puberty they start to uh, segregate. Uh, in this experiment, uh, we had a large, la relatively large litter of nine mice in which three were females and six were males. So three males were castrated. And then uh, at the age of puberty, microbiota was analyzed. And uh, it clearly shows that female uh, and castrated male uh, microbiota compositions are more similar than uh, non-uncastrated males. Uh, say, is telling us that hormones are important for microbial composition. Uh, finally, uh, in a very important experiment, we colonized gnotobiotic mice uh, with the same uh, input microbiota and then analyzed male and female uh, microbiota after puberty, and they're clearly different. So in different uh, experiments, uh, we can see the same that males and female microbiota differs. Uh, the question is, um, they are different, but the question is, is there a microbi male microbiota signature? Um, and uh, so uh, to answer this question, we compare the results of these four experiments. Um, it's uh, hard to appreciate because it's a lot of uh, writing and small graphs, but uh, the point here is very simple. You have four different experiments, and you see, see the differences in different phyla um, and different families. And uh, the conclusion from that is very simple. There are always differences between males and females, but the differences are always different. Um, so um, there is no male signature as such. And conclusion is that input microbiota affects gender differences in postpubescent animals. Hormones affect gender differences. And gender bias uh, does not depend on a specific microbial lineage uh, in type 1 diabetes. So that we wanted to test additionally. Um, and it was also possible that expansion of specific microbial lineage that we see in males uh, does ha has nothing to do with gender bias of the disease. So we used uh, one of the uh, enhanced lineages where lactobacillus is. So we used this VSL3 mix, which is rich in lactobacillus. And also bacterium that we call sex, because it was similar to E. coli and Shigella, uh, and it is a proteobacterium. So that's, uh, that's a background um, to the experiment. Uh, insulitis score, sorry, not, not yet. Uh, insulitis score, the uh, above 30%, uh, that's, that's uh, st strong insulitis. So in SPF conditions, females have it, males don't. Castrated males do have it. In germ-free conditions, both, both males and females have insulitis. Now we add uh, uh, these bugs, 
VSL3, uh, there is no difference uh, between males and females, but we had sex, and there is difference between males and females. So uh, different bacteria can behave very differently uh, despite uh, of their amplification, and uh, importantly, uh, that was a fact only achieved in, in uh, males. Now, we also used SFB uh, in uh, monocolonization experiment, and again, uh, only in SFB colonized males we saw the retardation of the disease, uh, but not in females. So, not all bacteria can influence the gender bias, and bacteria of different families can affect, the very different families can affect the gender bias. Um, now, uh, the second hypothesis suggests that uh, microbes can affect the levels of hormones uh, that reduce autoimmunity. But it also infers that male microbiota should affect disease development in females. Um, so, um, we did experiments uh, along these lines. And indeed, uh, uh, the similar uh, findings uh, were made by Jane Danska and her group. Uh, that uh, in reality, uh, colonization of mice increases the presence of uh, the levels of testosterone. So, um, if we just look at uh, 12 weeks old SPF mice, uh, they have uh, high levels of testosterone. This is mock castrated mouse, that's castrated mouse, so we're really measuring testosterone. Uh, but if we give mice different bacteria, like VSL3, uh, it ca they don't induce too much of the testosterone, but sex induces a lot of testosterone, and SFB induces a lot of testosterone. That suggests that maybe there is something in it that uh, some bacteria induce a lot of testosterone, but then, um, and uh, that may be the reason why, uh, my, why there is um, uh, sexual dimorphism. Uh, however, uh, there is a bacteria, bacterial mix, uh, ASF, and it induces rather good level of testosterone, a relatively good level of testosterone. Uh, but in two studies that we done in uh, 2008 and then uh, Jane Danska studies, uh, there was never a statistical difference between germ-free, not my, male mice, and ASF-associated um, mice. Uh, and then we decided to, uh, to make this very simple plot in which you plot, again, the uh, insulitis score uh, versus blood testosterone. And uh, open symbols are mice with no protective microbiota or non-protective microbiota. And dark signals are mice with protective microbiota. And you can see that even mice with very low testosterone levels, but if they have protective microbiota, uh, they are protected. So uh, since protective bacteria uh, protected a wide range of androgen concentration in blood, and ASF elicits uh, reasonable levels of androgens but doesn't protect males from type 1 diabetes, it is likely that linear hypothesis B uh, is also incomplete. So, um, um, uh, to make sure that uh, male microbiota does not protect females, we did this experiment. Um, uh, we uh, bred a trio of mice. And then we separated pregnant female, uh, and she was now a single mom. Uh, with the second male and female, uh, they, they were in traditional family. And then uh, males were removed from, from the studies, but uh, females were brought to, uh, to uh, uh, puberty, and then, uh, analyzed, and then uh, they were expected to develop disease, and we followed that. And there was absolutely no difference between females taken from traditional family exposed to male microbiota and single mom where females were not exposed to uh, male microbiota. Um, so uh, the conclusions from these experiments is that not all bacteria can influence the gender bias. Uh, bacteria of different families can affect the gender bias. And importantly, protective bacteria only work in male mice, indicating that they require male hormones to protect. Uh, and so we came up with this dual signal model in which you need uh, a factor, uh, at the factor steps you need both um, uh, bacteria, microbes, and hormones, um, and, uh, but they can be obviously amplified by regulatory loops. In, uh, some hormones amplify some microbes, and some microbes can amplify hormones. Um, uh, it also gives us an idea that these two signals do not have to be applied simultaneously but they can be applied 
differentially during the development of animals. Um, and I don't think we have time today to discuss that, but uh, we have some evidence for that. <coughs> now, uh, as I said, the things are always more complicated. This is Sialitis, uh, normal mouse, uh, and this is a uh, mouse with Sialitis. Um, and so we compared male and female uh, incidence of Sialitis in NOD mice. Uh, in SPF mice, uh, in females, there is a lot of Sialitis and uh, there is almost nothing in very low Sialitis in germ free females. Um, in, um, in, uh, if mice have diabetes, that seems to be a little bit higher. Uh, but then in, um, in germ free mice, uh, in SPF males and germ free males, there is no Sialitis whatsoever. Um, that so, uh, but if we uh, castrate some males, they have uh, increased level of sialitis, but it never goes uh, high enough uh, to the level of female. <coughs> so sialitis is microbiota dependent, sexually dimorphic, and hormone dependent. Uh, at the same time, if you compare the effect of castration on uh, sialitis versus insulitis, uh, it's very clear that castration only partially um, increases sialitis in, in males, but it brings insulitis to the level of females, uh, suggesting that there is more than hormones uh, in sexual dimorphism uh, on, in, um, in sialitis versus diabetes. Um, okay. Uh, and one last example of importance uh, of, uh, of gender is in this uh, experiment. So um, this is a DBDB mutation that occurred spontaneously uh, in leptin receptors, occurred spontaneously in NOD colony, Jack colony at Jackson. And I can see, you can see that the mutant mouse is very fat. Um, um, and in, uh, so the question we wanted to know or to have an answer for, is there a microbiota connection that affects autoimmunity in this mice? Because uh, what Leiter had shown is that they're fat and they lose type 1 diabetes. They still get type 2 diabetes because they're fat, but they don't have type 1 diabetes. So we wanted to know whether what is the connection between microbiota and autoimmunity in this mice. Uh, and originally we had no idea that it has anything to do with uh, gender bias. Um, uh, so we uh, analyzed histologically uh, the uh, insulitis in the pancreas and the answer was that there is a little bit, um, a little of increase in, uh, uh, in infiltration in the pancreas uh, in germ free mice versus SPF, uh, suggesting that microbes can be uh, responsible for, for the lack of diabetes development, but it wasn't anything striking. So we sort of uh, gave up on this project, uh, but uh, we found a very uh, striking result. So in SPF mice, uh, you're looking at uh, the weight of mice uh, during uh, their lifetime, and uh, males uh, and females both get fat, uh, very fat, um, and uh, in SPF conditions. But when we repeated this experiment in germ-free conditions, it turns out that males were lean, as predicted by uh, studies by other people that published similar, similar observations. Uh, but females uh, acquired, acquired fat. So um, uh, there is a huge difference between males and females in germ-free conditions, and we don't have any idea why it is so, uh, but we definitely want to learn that. Um, that's about the same. Uh, so restricting the studies of mutants to one sex can lead to incorrect results and to breaking off uh, the ramifications of, of interesting projects. If we would stop, at some point, we would never know uh, that's the case. Um, and uh, I can stop here, but I'd like to, to make a point uh, because that's a widely discussed topic uh, of host genetics and gut microbiota. Um, so uh, gut microbiota is different and very amenable to changes due to uh, diet and other insults. And mice seem to be a better model uh, to do that However, uh, there are 
there are dietary influences which are rapid and profound, and also facility room and cage effect. Uh, so it's not so easy to do in mice as well. So we use this method in which we uh, use the same input microbiota taken from an SPF mouse, and then we put it in, into uh, germ-free mice of different strains, and then um, you can do uh, 16S uh, uh, ribosomal uh, gene analysis. Uh, so the experiment I'm talking about, we use B6 feces, which we put into germ-free mice. Um, and there's three or four types of mice, B6, C3H, bulb C, and bulb C with different MHC, it's congenic mice. Uh, we bred these mice in isolators and then analyzed the microbiota in the progeny. In this way, uh, we don't have an uh, impact of the insult of transferring microbiota uh, artificially, but through the, uh, through the breeding. And um, so that should be, we're only looking at uh, changes that are relevant to strain genetic background. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, bulb B6 was very different from uh, C3H and bulb C uh, microbiota, it was clear. But also, there was a difference um, uh, that we could see uh, between MHC congenic strains based on the same, uh, on the same uh, background. Uh, but there was not many differences, and this is just the differences that are listed between these two strains. Uh, they went both ways. Some were higher in bulb C, some were higher in congenic strain. Uh, and so that's just examples. The good news is that they stay uh, in B6, they stay at the same level as in a donor's B6 strain. And then uh, they amplified to different degrees in different strains. Um, uh, uh, even, the different, if, even in this method, even if the differences are small, we can confirm that by uh, quantitative PCR and find that they are real. Um, and uh, then the second question we asked is that, is there MHC dependence uh, or is it based on IgA responses? Uh, if this MHC dependence is based on IgA responses. So um, IgA uh, can be produced in, in T cell dependent manner or independent manner. And if it is T cell dependent, that it has to be MHC dependent. Um, uh, so we did RNA IgA seq, which ha other labs have done already, of microbiota from uh, this MHC congenic strains, um, and that's a very simple experiment. You stain uh, bacteria with uh, anti-IgA antibodies, and then you sort physically into positive and negative, uh, and uh, then you're looking for differences. And in fact, we can easily segregate uh, uh, segregate. Uh, IgA positive versus IgA negative um, uh, microbiotas. But uh, if we look at the microbes that were different due to MHC and compare the uh, abundance in IgA positive and IgA negative um, compartments, then uh, this group of bacteria was not different at all. Uh, and that was not different. It was a little bit of uh, trend in SFB suggesting that uh, that may be some, com some um, contribution from IgA here that uh, was shown by other groups as well. Uh, but that was it. So there was no, uh, not much. So most of IgA responses are not linked to particular MHC. Uh, strain differences in microbiota only marginally depend on MHC polymorphism, probably due to T cell responses. And the role of polymorphic innate mechanisms need uh, further studies. Um, uh, we think that mol most of that is due to polymorphism in innate mechanisms. Uh, I'd like to stop here then and take questions.